Your body is not your own. Believe it or not, things are about to get even more disturbing. As women, you couldn't really refuse to have sex. Is he even like a human being? How is someone like that created or born? It's been over 50 years of this, and it's still not over. Welcome back to Rise and Fall. This particular episode is very hard today, so we're warning you now. You might know them as the Children of God or the Family International, but they've gone through many names. We'll be referring to the group as Children of God throughout this episode. We are so lucky to have a Children of God survivor, Faith Jones, whose grandfather actually started the cult, here with us today. So, let's get into it. Picture this, kiddos. It's 1968 in Huntington Beach, California. Just last summer, up the California coast in San Francisco, nearly 100,000 people were indulging in the summer of love, a celebration of sex, drugs, and rock and roll that reverberated across the whole US. This is you. <laughs> sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You know what, and I wear it proudly. Your mom hates those godless hippie fornicators, but she will let you go to Bible study at your local coffee shop with a cool new pastor. His ideas about free love are actually a lot like the hippies. He tells you Jesus wants you to f in your in your maybe even eat something, you know? Oh my God! <laughs> even mom can't argue with that. So how did a man preaching about Jesus and free love out of the back of a coffee shop bring about one of the most pervasive and longest lasting cults in US history, still in operation to this day? Let's find out. David Berg was born in 1919 in California. His parents were evangelists in the Christian and Missionary Alliance. From a young age, he believed his existence was miraculous, his purpose divine. The first self-described miracle was his birth. He survived being born with the flu during the 1918 influenza pandemic. According to the Family International website, at three, a car ran over Berg's foot, and despite doctors believing he would never walk again, he soon was walking. In another alleged medical anomaly, he nearly lost his sight after a water heater exploded in his face, but once again, recovered against the odds. It seems like the universe was trying to delete him. Berg claimed to have a sexual relationship with his nanny as a child that he viewed as a positive experience, a deeply harmful perspective that would contribute to future claims of child abuse within his organization. This dynamic would ultimately come back to haunt his family, culminating in his stepson's tragic murder-suicide. But more on that later. As an adult, he became a pastor for the Christian and Missionary Alliance. He worked at a small church for a few years, but left under mysterious circumstances. He claimed he quit in protest of racism he witnessed in his congregation. However, he did preach anti-Black and anti-Semitic beliefs in his lifetime, such as, quote, Jews and Blacks were conspiring to ruin the world, end quote. I think there's a more plausible explanation put forth by his estranged daughter, who alleges the real reason he left was due to his sexual misconduct. After leaving the Christian and Missionary Alliance, he worked as a traveling evangelist until his mother died in 1968. He then took over her work at the Light Club Coffee House about 100 feet from the sunny Huntington Beach Pier. It was here he established Teens for Christ, melding Christian beliefs, self-proclaimed prophecies, and his free will and law of love. A cool way for a 50-year-old man to convince teen girls to have sex with him. Got a lot of red flags right out of the gate. It's giving Manson energy. Mm-hmm. By 1969, he renamed the group Children of God and referred to himself as Moses David. After one of his prophecies foretold a devastating earthquake, the group left California and they began to spread across the Midwest so that they could warn people about the end of the world. At first, recruitment tactics were relatively standard, handing out literature and scrapbooks depicting their beliefs at college campuses or protests, seeking an audience of young radicals open to an alternative lifestyle. He encouraged these young people to become estranged from judgmental parents, calling for a revolution for Jesus. They targeted people at juvenile halfway homes, local YMCAs, retirement homes, and gang members, amongst others. Oftentimes they sought donations like money or meals, if not actual converts. By 1971, the group had caused enough controversy that Berg went into hiding, leading the group from a secret undisclosed location for the rest of his life. Some believe he went as far as Japan. Even before that, he was an elusive figure, never preaching in public and rarely photographed. The most his followers saw of him was drawn as a cartoon in cult literature, 
originally called the Mo Letters. He delivered his messages in comic book form, mixing the images with liturgy. I love watching anime and I love comic books, you know? Very deep in the Marvel universe. Mm -hmm. I would have liked the comic books. I like comic books. I mean, how narcissistic do you have to be to f have people make a comic book about you? I don't know, maybe it's more digestible. Yeah, and it's also more appealing to kids. Yeah, so you would have been so far kind of into yeah, this part. Yeah, because I would have been a teen, right? Yeah. Teen Joyce is gullible. I'm Faith Jones. I am an attorney and an author and the granddaughter of David Berg, the founder of the Children of God. What was your relationship with your grandfather like? My grandfather pervaded every single aspect of our lives. His teachings, the Mo Letters, which is, you know, the comic books, that everything was all based on his teachings. But at the same time, I never met him in person. By the time I was born, he was already in hiding. His whereabouts was the most highly kept secret of the group. My mother, she joined when she was very young, I think maybe 20, 21 years old. She came out of the hippie generation. My father was the son of the founder. My parents really helped found the group initially. He was everybody's grandfather. That was how he was portrayed because when you were in the group, you really left your outside influences, outside families. We had a very unusual and interesting life. Grew up in a big family. My dad had two wives. I knew that that was very unusual in the world, but my parents were very happy. You know, we grew up on a farm with lots of animals and very active. I always looked back on my childhood as being quite happy, which is interesting, but there was also a lot of abuses. There were things that happened that I knew made me afraid, but that wasn't the same as bad. We didn't go to school, our parents didn't work. The whole group was designed to completely live and exist outside of society. Berg expected his followers to isolate themselves socially from normative society and the people plugged into it, who he referred to as systemites. From their communes and shared living spaces, cult members were expected to communicate with him via video, filming thousands of hours to show him what their daily life was like, giving them a nickname as the original camcorder cult. Followers practicing communal living were discouraged from having jobs outside the commune or sending their children to formal school for the fear that systemites would threaten their way of life. Berg went so far as to threaten that Antichrist forces would kill them or the government would imprison them. He punished members who attracted bad publicity, even the children who were expected to evangelize and work upwards to 30 to 40 hours a week. Our homeschooling was maybe a few hours a day. I think for a lot of kids it was a bit sporadic. If there was something more important to do, like go out and witness about Jesus, then you know school was sort of brushed to the side. My grandfather didn't feel that you needed more than about an eighth grade education. I think probably a lot of kids got about a sixth grade education. And after that, you were just supposed to learn basic skills because you weren't gonna get a job. You were growing up in the family. You were gonna have babies, either take care of kids, go out singing, go out witnessing, wash dishes, clean the house. Like there wasn't really something to aspire to. According to the 19. 1994 documentary, Children of God, Berg ruled over every facet of daily life. Followers were told how many sheets of toilet paper they could use to wipe themselves, three. How many cups of coffee they could drink, what they could wear, and more. No one's gonna tell me how many tissue papers to wash my ass with, so. <laughs> Right there, I would've been out. What a rat. Among their many restrictions, followers were generally forbidden to read anything that wasn't Berg's religious literature and were discouraged from taking medicine. So the foundation was supposed to be the Bible, but of course my grandfather had his own interpretation. Some of the fundamental principles were to be separate from society, not work for mammon. They used the verse, everyone lived together and had all things common, which meant that nobody owned anything. You didn't have any personal ownership possessions, you didn't own property, you didn't buy stuff. So you were not supposed to take sort of ownership of your own family even, not your own wife, husband children. Any money that came in or any money that you earned, you had to turn it over to the group. They didn't believe in birth control, so they had very big families. So how many siblings did you have? I have 12 now, mostly all half siblings. Can you imagine trying to support and feed yourselves and these children on donations and going out busking? You know, it was a very, very difficult life, very sacrificial life. And then the other thing that I think the group really became famous for was its beliefs around sex. Much of Berg's theology mimicked counterculture ideology. The idea of free love became the law of love, 
a celebration of sexuality that discouraged shame and taboo. While this sounds great in theory, it quickly became exploitative. He enforced participation in practices such as sharing, a term he used to motivate followers to engage in a polyamorous manner, but to an extreme. He believed there shouldn't be any rules that would limit a sexual partner, which is why some alleged sharing extended to minors as well for a period of time. Can you give us more insight on the child abuse that occurred in The Children of God? There was never a time I didn't know what sex was. My earliest coloring book was how babies are made with all the diagrams and all the pictures and like a hippie couple with a big erection and everything. I was coloring that when I was three. They didn't want their children to have sort of the sexual repression and the hang-ups that many people have grown up with. So they were like, well, sex is beautiful and it's natural and it's clean and we should be open about it. But there was a sense I had inside myself, even though I was taught that this is all fine, I could feel it, it didn't feel right. Believe it or not, things are about to get even more disturbing. In letters written by Berg in 1985, he wrote, quote, I think as children, before the girls start menstruating and the boys start seminating, that's their opportunity to have all the sex they want. For the sake of potential problems with the system, we've set a rule for our girls that they can't have sex after their period till they're 15, to avoid them having babies so young that they are shocking the doctors and authorities, end quote. You were considered to be an adult when you were 12. Some of the older girls than me ended up, you know, having to have sex with adult men when they were 12. And I think that really, you know, had a strong impact on them. Former female members have testified that women couldn't say no to being shared when men propositioned them. They were made to feel they were unloving, uncaring, failing themselves in the group, and that they didn't belong there if they tried to refuse sex. Some described it retrospectively as humiliating and compared it to slavery. Contraception was banned, so the woman gave birth a lot to give more children to the cult that abused them for the pleasure of a man. There's like a degree of detachment I can feel myself kind of deploying because this is so horrible. As kids, like that's what you're learning growing up. Like you're seeing that happen to your mom or your sister. It's like a prison. And you can't say no, you can't. And then you watch your child can't say no either. The gravity of it is just, it's like too much. When the sexualization came into the cult, he did it slowly. He was prepping. People were joining at 14, 15, 16, 19, 20 years old. When my grandfather brought in that this concept of sexual freedom, it was also the 70s. That was all the rage then. That's what everybody was doing. So it wasn't such a stretch. By 1974, the children of God were forced to flee the U.S. The New York Attorney General had opened an investigation on what they referred to as a cult and official documentation. They were on a mission to find evidence of tax evasion, rape, polygamy, draft dodging, incest, and kidnapping, among other crimes. Ultimately, they were not able to prosecute, a ruling that was considered a little shocking and vague at the time. Apparently, much of the evidence they found fell under First Amendment rights, generally speaking, constitutional protection to freedom of religion. Within a decade of its creation, the Children of God had 4,500 members living in 600 communes across 70 different countries. Now international, with hundreds of communes in dozens of countries around the world, Berg saw a whole world of possibilities, so many people to convert. But how would he reach them? Within a few years, the group had rebranded as The Family, or The Family of Love. Perhaps an attempt at a clean slate after their legal issues, though he still could not escape it. In 1978, the same year as their official rebrand, the country of France banned the group. It's more likely the rebrand was the result of infighting caused by Berg's hungry new recruitment strategies. Around this time, they somehow plummeted even further down the mall rabbit hole. He began emphasizing unchecked sharing, sexual sharing, but with fewer rules than before, as central to their theology. My grandfather had twisted those verses in the Bible that talk about, you know, if a man hunger, give him food, if he thirst, give him to drink, give him your coat kind of thing, right? And he would say, well, sex is a bodily need, <laughs> just like food and clothing and stuff. So you need to be willing to give that to, you know, your, your fellow man. And so they would have a schedule, like even on the wall, with like who was supposed to sleep with who. If there were unmarried men, they would have a weekly sharing schedule. He began preaching that women's duty was to use sex to gain new male members. This practice became known as flirty fishing. 
Berg gave various instructions on how to accomplish this, writing, tease him, flirt with him, then screw him until he drops over, end quote. My personal experience with flirty fishing was really experiencing my mother doing it. When I was a kid, I would sometimes go along with my mother. For a lot of the women, it was a sacrifice. They were told, your body is not your own. And even as I grew up, you know, and being made to sleep with men within the group that I didn't want to, that was always the concept for everything. You don't own yourself, your body is not your own. Because when you can get someone to believe they don't own themselves, they have no right to speak up, they have no right to say no then you can get them to do all kinds of things. This man sees nothing but his own goals and wants, and then people are just pawns. It really shows that he wants more power because he wants to abuse more people. These changes didn't go over well with all members. Some people did have a problem with it, and there were some people that left. It wasn't like people just accepted it automatically. A lot of people left when they began to have the child sex. Actor Joaquin Phoenix's family were members of the Children of God until 1977. He claims his parents decided to leave the group due to the rise of flirty fishing, but it was not soon enough. His older brother, River Phoenix, who was seven when his family left, said he was sexually assaulted for the first time when he was four years old. River, a talented actor, Hollywood heartthrob, and tragic historical symbol, died by overdose at just 23 years old. Likewise, Actress Rose McGowan described her family's attempt to leave the cult in the early 80s. Her father worked as a cartoonist on Berg's Mo Letters, which later organized into a periodical called The New Good News. When he was asked to start illustrating comics depicting sharing between adults and children, he knew he had to go. Rose was nine at the time, and after they fled, McGowan says her family was forced to move multiple times as the group continued to find, harass, and threaten them into coming back. She told People Magazine in 2011, quote, we had to leave on the sly. My dad, Nat, Daisy, and I escaped with my dad's other wife in the middle of the night. I remember running through a cornfield in thunder and lightning, holding my dad's hand and running as fast as I could to keep up with him. We hid in an old stone house and had to boil pots of hot water to take baths. The cult sent people to find us. I remember a man trying to break in with a hammer. Wahlberg lost some followers implementing his fishy new philosophy. On the whole, the family kept growing. Once again, they were 15,000 members strong at its peak. It wasn't until 1987 when the AIDS epidemic and STI outbreaks began to affect the group that the practice of flirty fishing ended. The family passed new codes surrounding children's safety in 1983, but ex-members say those rules were not seriously acknowledged or enforced for years. They were starting to get heat from authorities, but also even within the group, as these young kids were growing up and then they were starting to share their experiences and share how traumatizing it was for them to have adult men coming on to them and trying to fondle them and stuff when they were you know, kids and stuff. I think they also began to see that maybe it wasn't the most helpful practice. That didn't change the concept within the group. In the early 90s, over a decade after their exile, members of the family began to reappear in the US, where somehow their existence began to be normalized. In 1992, the group performed music for First Lady Barbara Bush at the White House. And by 1993, new communes began to pop up, especially in sunny Southern California back where it all started. However, around the world they were causing controversy as fishing had gotten them into hot water. One of the big things that had happened in the group was there was no objective standard. The right became whatever the cult leader made up. You see this so much in cults, where some leader or some man takes whatever the doctrine is and twists it to fit their own need for control or their own perversions, to satisfy their own desires. That corruption ends up really hurting a lot of people and ends up taking something where there was a lot of sort of positive things that these young people were trying to do and just creating so much abuse. By the late 80s, a third of members lived in Latin America. 
a sizable population that attracted negative attention from authorities. In 1990, the Argentinian government raided a family property, seizing cocaine, pornographic videos, and children's books with condoms between the pages. Because most of the evidence was considered circumstantial, they were unable to prosecute at large. But it did put the group on Interpol's watch list, and they began their own investigation into David Burke. In Spain in 1992, officials arrested 10 members for allegedly perverting children. By 1993, raids on the family in France, where their existence had been outlawed, led to many arrests and at least 72 children placed in protective custody. That same year in Argentina, officials conducted another raid that resulted in hundreds of people being taken into custody, many of whom were international citizens. By some estimates, as many as 140 children were taken into protective care but later returned to their families. Meanwhile, down under, the Australian government investigated six of their communes around Sydney and Melbourne, removing 142 minors who officials suspected were sexually abused. The cities were forced to drop charges due to insufficient evidence, and the kids were returned to their parents. Berg slipped through the cracks again, thanks to tricky legal loopholes. This brings us up to 1993, the year that Berg predicted as the end of days for many years. Dating back to his early prophecies in the 70s, Berg predicted that the Antichrist was coming, triggering the end of the world. At one point, he believed a comet would strike Earth and destroy the US. And obviously, as those dates passed, his ETA for the apocalypse had to shift. But 1993 came and went. Bill Clinton became president without the Antichrist or world-ending comet. Berg only survived it a few months, passing away in 1994, called home by the spirits of the men he delusionally claimed to be his personal guides, Martin Luther, Douglas MacArthur, Rasputin, and the Pied Piper. Upon his death, Berg's legal wife, Karen Zerby, took over. She went by monikers like Maria and Eve. Under Karen's leadership, some changes were eventually made. By 2004, a decade after Berg's death, she changed the name from the family to the Family International. With the name change came the loosening of some rules, such as allowing people to have jobs in society and live outside of a commune. However, until 2009, the cult was still heavily focused on the imminent apocalypse. For decades, they preached that becoming one of their members was the only way to ensure your soul would go to heaven after the apocalypse. But with the change in theology published in 2009, they claimed the apocalypse was not necessarily imminent and instructed followers to make plans for the future. Turns out your soul is probably safe for now. In 2005, David Berg's stepson, Ricky Rodriguez, died in a murder-suicide after stabbing a former nanny who he alleged had sexually abused him as a child. Ricky left a video describing the murder as an act of vengeance for what he and his sisters had suffered in childhood. He went on the record to say that Berg had sexually abused his own daughters and granddaughters, and that he hoped to one day see his mother held responsible and prosecuted for child abuse. But even as he came forward, little to no action was taken perhaps a factor into why he would want to take matters tragically into his own hands at the age of 29. He wasn't the only one whose trauma escalated to violent endings. Between 1992 and 2005, the Family International confirmed at least 10 suicides by former members, but groups of ex-members believe that number to be at least three times higher, with as many as 30 possible victims. Perhaps most haunting was the Victor program a separate facility that was created to punitively hold and retrain teenagers and adults who pushed back against Berg's expectations. One ex-member says his brother, who later died by suicide, was forced to be a part of it. He was part of a detention and retraining program involving sleep deprivation, food deprivation, manual labor, silence restriction, and isolation. Another ex-member who also died by suicide described it as an oppressive and brutal system of thought reform, which utilized mental, psychological, and even physical abuse. Anybody who tried to get out or tried to have their voice heard was punished. It's scarier than any horror movie I've ever watched. When you're in that environment, you're cut off. And you're living in all these foreign countries where you're trying to learn the local language. It's a very different environment than how we think of today when we're just sort of gutted with so much information. And so when you isolate people to that extent, you isolate them from their families, you isolate them from work, and you flood them with this one way of thinking. Every time I think about this car, I just think how evil you could be, 
how evil really does exist in this world. And sometimes I forget that. David Burke was as evil as it gets. You had to find so much power within yourself to decide to, to leave. Can you kind of talk about what brought you there and then what life was like once you did leave Children of God? How I decided to leave was interesting. It was kind of incremental. When I was 12, my father, having been stripped of his leadership position, was actually shipped away and put into isolation. And then my mother and her three kids were shipped off to Thailand. My mother had a nervous breakdown and we ended up in America. We ended up getting kind of accidentally excommunicated. We were living in a trailer. We couldn't find food. I was like with a can in a parking lot. And so my mother going through that too, that was a very traumatic experience for her. And I think she began to see the cult differently. We lived with my grandmother and I went to school for six months. But I actually thought, huh, I like this. Teachers know stuff. I can figure out how to do good on tests and things like that. It was kind of cool. My father eventually came and got us and we went back to the farm. So when we went back, we weren't as in, you know, uh, in our hearts, I think, in some ways. I also had ended up having a brief period of time when I went to China and we had to pretend to be normal because if they found out you were a missionary, you would get kicked out of the country. So having kind of these glimpses of sort of what a kind of normal life was, was able to open my mind up. Going back into that commune where you're just, every movement is ordered, basically, I couldn't see a future for myself. I actually became depressed. And when it just kept going on, I was like, okay, I've got to make a change. So then I had this desire to go to college and my mother actually supported me in this. It wasn't that I thought the group was wrong, it wasn't that I didn't believe it, because I didn't, still didn't really know any different. But this burning desire to learn, I mean, my, my, I was so hungry for just more than the same old, same old mole letters rehashed in a different way over and over and over again. You know, I wanted my mind to expand. I had just turned 23 years old when I left the Children of God. After 40 years of bad press, in 2010, the Family International went through a major restructuring called the Reboot that announced the closure of the majority of their communal living spaces, quote, in order to better achieve our purpose of reaching the world with the gospel message and to allow for greater diversity, end quote. Essentially, the group got with the times and now functions primarily as an online organization. Why are they still a thing? I don't, I don't know. Why do they get to exist? I don't know. Delete the website. Yeah. It's been over 50 years of this. And it's still not over. The version of the children of God today is, is, is a very watered down version, I would say. They went almost mainstream. So a lot of the doctrines that we're talking about, they don't practice or believe today. I think what's difficult for a lot of people is to be able to distinguish between what was good and the things that they appreciated and what was bad. I think it's hard for people who have been so brainwashed to see that clearly. And when you think about the, some of these people who, who spent their entire adult lives, you know, from the time they were teenagers in this group and they sacrificed everything and they gave everything and they come out and they have no retirement, they own no property. To go back and say, wow, my life was built on this lie, this huge lie, like how difficult would that be? We might never know what is happening in the digital shadows, but the lasting effects of the trauma and abuse many of the adults and children suffered under decades of Berg's leadership is evident. So what has helped you go through the trauma that you went through in The Children of God? I always felt like I had a, a strong, direct relationship with God. So often through the trauma, that's the only person that I could turn to was God. And I really believed and had faith that God was there for me and that everything was going to work out. Everyone experiences trauma. It's how you handle it that makes the difference. I want to sure. give you a hug now, no. can we? As we've seen in so many of the cults we've studied so far, what started as a call for those looking for love, community, and freedom was quickly weaponized against them into tools for power and corruption. And the suffering for so many has been immeasurable. And that concludes another episode of Rise and Fall. Thank you so much, Faith, for sharing your story with us. And to everyone out there, Thank you for listening to the stories of the victims who were a part of this cult and to anyone who was a victim. You are loved, you are cared for, and you are strong. And you deserve the best of everything. Yeah, we're giving you all a digital big hug right now. And also, I'm gonna hug you. <laughs> we love y'all. Stay love safe you. out there, be kind.
In our next episode, we are looking at a cult and a terrorist organization from Japan that's responsible for brutal and deadly chemical gas attacks across Tokyo. Be sure to watch.